And now for the Moneratopia Price Report segment. Okay, there it was. All right. Awesome. The graphic really is pretty cool. Kudos to whoever made it. All right, All right. so um, this is the Monero chart, obviously. Hopefully, this should be a familiar chart for everyone at this point. Um, as we talked about for the past couple weeks, we, we ended up with a little bit of resistance at places that seemed kind of obvious, right? So these were kind of uh, long-term standard deviation bands uh, and these guys as well. I say long-term, it's, it's more like they've been developing for the past few years. They're not the, the longest-term standard deviation bands, which are, which are the ones up here. But yeah, we found a little bit of resistance there. And currently, I think we're experiencing some of the effects of the general crypto market having a little bit of trouble. If we when we look at Bitcoin price a little bit later, you'll see what I'm what I'm talking about. But overall, it's you know everything still looks pretty good. Everything still looks nice. We Bitcoin versus Monero chart has found also a little bit of resistance. So for a while, Monero was kind of outperforming the rest of the market. We had diverged just a little bit from the rest of the market in terms of uh, of the overall price performance. Right, we we were going up. Everyone else was kind of flat topped or pegged out. So. These long-term standard deviation bands, these are lower standard deviation bands, obviously, the uh, the orange bands. So this is kind of a <clears throat> the first place you would expect to maybe find some resistance, and that's basically where we found it. At In reality, I have very often seen charts. I've seen charts that will break down, come to these lower standard deviation bands that you can see are already kind of starting to curl under. And typically, you'll tag them and then come back down. So... It wouldn't be too surprising if we were to see the Bitcoin versus Monero ratio. Take a break here, take a pullback. Maybe, maybe it could just like sort of um, hang out here for a little bit. I feel like if we think that there's going to be more gains in the crypto market, you know that it's that same story as, as we get with gold, where they'll do the pressure release valve. You know, the price sometimes has to come up. There really is organic demand there. But then once they go on the next leverage hype cycle, printing cycle they don't pump that into gold they pump it into the other we'll just call them shit coins in this case i don't want to call you guys shit coins uh but most of you are what are you gonna what are you gonna do about it um so yeah we're, we're kind of looking at a situation here where uh the the hype that we had for a while the the nice big strong up movement that we had for a while uh, does does seem like it needs to take a break we can even see that a little bit in the z scores here uh, monero being in red so this is, again, these are Z-scores, so this is how is the asset performing relative to its own moving average over the past 100 days. Um, we could look at 300 days or, or any timeline, but uh, I like the 100-day chart, a nice balance between the short-term and the long-term. We had talked about last week saying that, yeah, we're, we're kind of getting a little bit high on these Z-scores, and, and to think that we, we might need some pause here. And we, we said that by sort of looking backwards across the, the places that Monero had been. Uh, previously so if we look back here in 2023 that was january um, we're kind of like at those same levels one thing that's interesting about z scores is that we haven't really pulled back too badly on price but you'll notice the z scores have come back significantly um if if price were to just remain flat like let's suppose we pumped let's suppose we pumped at 200 today and then we stayed exactly at 200 for the next four weeks you would actually see the z scores come up and then even though the price would be the same, the Z-scores would actually drop back until they leveled off at the moving average, um, which in this case is represented by zero. So it's an interesting way of looking at the charts rather than looking at the like the absolute moving average. You sort of center the moving average as the zero point, and then you see how the how the price is oscillating around that. So it, it's an interesting way of looking at, at prices. I recommend people use it. Uh, you know, I don't think I've actually published this script. Maybe I'm going to make a note right here. Publish Z scores because maybe some people want to use it. Uh, okay, so going back to Monero, we could look at the divergences. Poloniex somehow has managed to find it in their hearts to to list Monero at a slightly higher price than Kraken, almost half a percent higher. <laughs> so um, I don't know who paid off Justin Sun, but whichever one of you that did it in the Monero community, uh, thank you. Tip of the hat to you. Obviously, that's a joke. So you know, please, Justin Sun, don't come at me, bro. Don't come at me. Uh, okay, we're looking at the same story here with the uh, with the XMR versus Ethereum chart. I don't like that that we didn't actually get to this area right here. That 
it's, you know, it's not, it's not great action. That's not really how it's supposed to be at the same time. There's nothing saying that this doesn't have to just be a pullback before Monero comes a little bit more to the upside. So there, there's nothing here that's saying like, Hey, the show's over, you know, the, this pump is, is done. And now we're, we're stuck back in our, I am not saying that, Hey, we, now we're stuck back in our, our range here that we've been for the past few years. Um, but you know, like we said, there, there's, there's the potential that we need some kind of pause moment here. They were, these were obvious levels to expect some kind of, um, resistance and it does look like we're getting ever so slightly pulled back, but that's only looks like to the tune of about 12% here so far. So nothing terribly concerning. Maybe the Monero gold chart is worth taking a look at. Yeah. So this is kind of interesting. So we basically came from the very bottom of, of the XMR versus gold chart from these standard deviation bands. Um, all the way up, a little bit of resistance there, not, nothing nothing major. Um, this chart is kind of dirty, and this is one thing that I... There are some charts that do wave magic quite well, others don't. Uh, this is one chart that is, in some sense, like the very long-term bands here seem to be functioning quite, quite well. But you'll notice these moving average bands, the white bands, they're all just kind of all over the place. And to me, this is kind of a function of a lot of the price fuckery, fuckery that they've done over the course of years. And it just dirties up the wave magic, which is interesting because I rarely see wave magic charts that aren't usually have pretty well defined lines. Um, in the case of Monero, I, I had noticed that there just seems to be this kind of uh, noise that happens in these charts that I, I rarely see elsewhere. So I felt like that was kind of. It was like one of those things where I said, yeah, we know that they've been messing with the price and their fractional reserve for the longest time. And uh, we know they love to sort of disrupt the price. So it would kind of make sense that you might see that um, reflected in, in a chart that that feels a little bit more schizophrenic from um, uh, a standard deviation standpoint. OK, but anyways, um, from the, the, the thing that stands out to me here in this chart is that we came up to some point here. Um, basically in between these two, right, the shorter term standard deviations. And right now we're sort of testing this area right here. So, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, Monero versus gold, interesting chart. Um, you know, I think both assets that we like to hold. So, uh, the Monero transactions have actually taken a little bit of a pullback here in the past, uh, let's just say week or so we were hovering, we were sort of in between 30 and 40,000. Okay. A little dip right there temporarily, but we came down and took another dip here. And and we've sort of been below thirty thousand for a while. I actually, tagged the twenty thousand level. So um, <clears throat> yeah, it seems like it seems like there's some usage dropping off, which is interesting. Maybe you think that Porkfest would encourage more usage. Uh, perhaps it's just not large enough um, to to really account for you know five ten thousand transactions in a day. Uh, I don't know, but that's that's you know that's what the chart looks like. Um, we're gonna take a look here at the XMR nodes if it loads. Yeah, so we seem to still be pretty flat, 22,000. We seem to have been at 22,000 notes for quite a long time now. Um, so nothing really changed here with this chart. Let's take a look at the broader crypto markets. And the, the big story here was that the SEC um, informed, I, I believe it was consensus, but they like they issued a, a formal letter saying that they dropped their investigation uh, against Ethereum. So, which kind of makes sense, right? They approved the ETF. And then actually Gensler told the Senate that the ETF should be finished by the end of the summer. So maybe um, longest time frame before September, but maybe even as soon as July. He wasn't specific with the time frame, but he said everything's moving along smoothly and uh, and to expect the approval. So that there's a good chance that that will drive the... Um, <clears throat> sorry, here's the Bitcoin chart. There's a good chance that that will drive the end of this current, um, this current uh, uh, chart pattern. Right, so you kind of got this like capping line here at, at this point, right? We can't come up to here, come up to here. <clears throat> Still not really able to make higher highs. Things are just kind of bleeding off here. You know, maybe they'll continue bleeding off. Hell, for all we know, we'll see something like that, you know, and then come back here, right? That kind of deal. Yeah, that's the kind of thing that you'd expect in crypto markets at this point. There, there really is still a lot of <laughs> a lot of price fuckery that happens overall in general. You know, clearing the shorts, clearing the longs, clearing the shorts again. <laughs> Clearing the longs again, and, and then finally moving to the upside, you know, just trying to wick people out of their their leveraged positions, which is why it's so dangerous to trade leverage, like especially anything that's above the three, four x level. You start trading five, ten x leverage, you really are just asking to get wiped out. Um, and and in a lot of ways, I think that a lot of the volatility that we see in crypto is specifically driven by traders, um, where the big market makers can just go in there. And just wipe out your positions repeatedly, right? Wreck the lungs, wreck the shorts, bart to the upside, bart to the downside before the final move, the real move is actually made. So, um, yeah, I do think that there's a good chance that this ETF approval is going to see a little bit of extra cash flow into the markets. 
Um, it's not going to be as amazingly bullish as the Bitcoin ETF was, obviously, but um, I think that, that that should give us a reasonable input. I say us, but, you know, am I included? I guess I'm kind of a, a degenerate gambler sometimes, so maybe I'll say us. Um, but that should give us an opportunity for, for the Bitcoin chart here to break through these resistances and perhaps make it to something. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe it could actually make 100K Christmas finally, or maybe not. Right. Who knows? Uh, so we could take a look then at the Ethereum versus Bitcoin chart since, uh, you know, the spotlight's kind of shifting over to Ethereum, as we have talked about at length here in previous episodes. And one thing that you'll I think this is a bullish chart. So one thing you'll notice again is you've got these lower standard deviation bands. Uh, the chart, you know, kind of like establishes finally some bottom, <laughs> maybe washes out. I, I do think that a lot of the I think it's very plausible that the Ethereum sort of investigation and some of the negative news against Ethereum and, and the promotion of this narrative that only Bitcoin will get an ETF and Ethereum is a security, so it will never get an ETF. I think a lot of that was sort of uh, promulgated, if you will, as a means of allowing market makers to sort of stack up their bags as people were panic selling. Right now, you come to the upside here, right? You come all the way from the downside, catch these. I don't know if you can see them, but these this white banded area these are very long term uh moving averages so those were like very very large supports these bands are a little bit shorter term bands the orange bands so anyways you come from the bottom there you come to the very top where these orange bands end um, and then also sort of where these like very short term blue bands like it's all like a nice convergence in combination with the pleb line so it's like you you hit those levels and you say okay that that's a place to wait right that's a place to expect a little bit of resistance which is what's happened here um, but now what you see is a pullback kind of stopping in the middle of that range and then immediately trying to press up again against these bands again. So yeah, any breaking of this line here, any, any action that looks anything like that, like that starts to look really bullish. So what I'm getting at is that the Ethereum Bitcoin chart is, is really actually looking like it's, it's, it's getting close to the point that it's going to break out. So if you're the kind of person that likes to likes to trade the ratios you can do things like get on get on some leverage platform you can short bitcoin and long ethereum so that you have kind of a zero risk exposure to the crypto market overall going up or down but um your exposure is to you know if ethereum goes up um then and, and bitcoin goes up you should still make some kind of profit um or at least break even but anyways um yeah this chart is, is getting ready to break out uh what is what it looks like to me but enough about Ethereum. This is not the Ethereum show. Um, neither is it the Bitcoin show, but, you know, we have to look at everything in context. Dominance here on the Bitcoin chart. This thing is, uh, I mean, to me, it looks like it's also ready to kind of start breaking down. It doesn't have to happen immediately, but this this is getting long in the tooth, if you ask me. So we can take a look at the macro in that case. Um, let's see, where to start, where to start. Uh, maybe I'll show, maybe we won't start with the, with the normie macro stuff. What we'll do here is hum to... This is what I'm looking at. Okay, this is the, the the unemployment rate in white, and then the stock market, the S&P specifically, is is in the candles. And one thing that we've seen here um, that I don't like, that's not a good sign, is that the unemployment rate has already started to rise. Now it's coming from very low levels, 3.4%, and now it's up to 4%, but that's a significant rise that's happened, and it's, it's now consistent. Like, we can call this a confirmed trend. Unemployment is now actually rising. 4% is still, like, historically low, but I just want to show you guys throughout the past two decades... The 2008 event, you saw unemployment come down, hit a bottom, and then start spiking up. And this, these blue thingies right here, the, um, the, I don't know, the price distance and time, that's just a copy of this right here. So I'm just overlaying what's happened for the current situation on previous situations. And really, it's just here to kind of give you a visual reference for before the 2008 crash really happened in earnest, you had already seen a significant rise in the unemployment rate. Um, same thing with the, with the crash of the dot-com crash of 2000, um, you had already seen unemployment coming up. Now, the big difference here is that the stock market had already started coming down as the unemployment was rising, uh, in both of these instances. So you can, you might say, okay, well, that's not quite the same thing here because the stock market just continues to put on new all-time highs, but it is one of those little things that we're looking at. We're saying, Hey, you know, we're looking at these, um, we're looking at this very long-term yield curve inversion. We're looking at this flat top on the federal funds rate, which is in the white line here. And the Fed is talking about lowering rates. But every time the Fed has lowered rates for the past two decades, that has signaled the beginning of the end, right? That doesn't, that doesn't mean that, that the gains are totally over. 
Um, but the Fed lowering rates and the bond market starting to come down, in some cases violently, and the correction of the yield curve for the past 20 years has been associated with a kind of tail risk event where the market crashes 30%, 40%, 50%. So we're, we, we're seeing all this. And, and if you're on Twitter, if you're on the social medias, if you follow any of the, the influencers, the price influencers, you'll see that these guys are talking about this and they've been talking about it for a year. And last year, you know, we were kind of, we were trying to be a bit careful. I was saying, Hey, maybe August. And then that ended up being wrong. You know, I kind of had to pivot my, uh, my thesis quickly as price proved me wrong. And you have to be agile because you're going to be wrong sometimes in, in, in markets. And then, so after like say October, the, you know, my personal kind of narrative was it's up, like the direction's up. Like I'm not necessarily going to buy these levels. I, that's why I got in earlier. Um, but you know, we've just been looking at the directions up for a while. And and as we talked about maybe in the past week or so, the tail risk still isn't acute. There is no acute tail risk in these markets. We're not seeing anything that's just majorly concerning that tells us, hey, you know, the 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 red flags are are uh, flying, right? The the warning signals are flashing. We're just we're not seeing that. So especially when it comes to the stock market, the name of the game is you always stay in the stock market. Um, unless you just like have some, some crystal ball that tells you that you're in tail risk. I think that we do have, um, finally now after, after watching this for so long, I think we do have good mechanisms to see when that's happening. Um, but that's why you continue to see the stock market go up because people just don't want to get out of the stock market unless there's just terrible, terrible signs out there, which we don't see. So, um, this chart right here is the dollar index. Um, we're kind of like flirting here back in these upper standard deviation bands. I really do think that it makes, makes sense to me. This thing is going to continue up to get to here. I was thinking that this, that we would get to this level here, these upper blue bands. I was thinking we would get there sooner rather than later, um, but we took a pullback here, and um, so now we're kind of in this in this position where I, I still think that it makes sense to to get up to this level here. So the question is, is that level going to be a capping spot? And I think the dollar index tends to move slow enough that we would probably see that, like if if the dollar index is going to bust to the upside. What we might see is something like this, right? It's going to consolidate at these levels. And then if that happens, that's kind of like this would actually look like um, a tail risk. Maybe not. I don't want to call it a tail risk event, but that looks like a point in the favor of tail risk. If we see again, if we see the Dixie um, showing us a bullish chart here right now, it, it is bullish, but it's still kind of capped by these very long term um, standard deviation bands that were set during the bear market uh, that we came out of from 2022. So, um, there's nothing has changed with the reverse repos. That's still just holding flat. Gold, gold is actually hanging on pretty good here. I was, um, if you guys remember, I was saying, hey, I'm a little bit concerned. This chart doesn't look great. It still doesn't look great. I would still want to try and call this a sort of head and shoulders pattern. And this thing could still play out like a head and shoulders pattern. And the target would actually be this area right here. So um, yeah, gold is still kind of in a limbo position. Um, again, head and shoulders, these, these cutely named little chart patterns, they don't ever have to play out. They don't always play out in the way, you know, it's not a hundred percent obviously, but, um, uh, yeah, I would still say this chart is kind of in limbo. I wouldn't necessarily be a, a buyer of gold here, like in terms of a major investment. Um, but Hey, you know, things can go anyway. Things don't have to obey the chart patterns. Um, and last we'll look at the stock market really quick. Uh, basically the S and P and the NASDAQ have kind of this similar, um, have kind of the similar pattern where, sorry, uh, since 2023, you can see this uptrend, right? So we drew the first connection point here. We draw the next connection point there. And then we hit this guy again. Well, okay. We're, we're bumping up against that connection point. So, uh, the week was overall positive, but it sort of hit this resistance here and then pulled back on, on the last two days. Um, same kind of thing happened for the NASDAQ. Uh, I'm inclined to believe that there's still probably more gains on the way here. Um, yeah, in, in this case for the NASDAQ, it wasn't, it wasn't quite as long-term, uh, of, of a chart pattern that, that we're bumping up against, but you know, still kind of there. Um, I still think that like, again, there's probably still some more gains on the way for, for stocks. doesn't mean it has to happen now. Uh, this, this little wick right there on, on the NASDAQ, that does look kind of like a hammer, um, just slightly. So maybe some kind of pullback needs to happen, but. Um, overall, like I, I do think that this is a natural target. These purple bands that are rising, I think that getting to those purple bands at some point seems to be a natural target. Um, so yeah, we still got the election going on this year. I feel like, you know, you got to feel like that uh, the current administration is going to do everything they can to try and keep things at a, at a nice state, and economically speaking, so they don't piss too many people off, right? Because 
if you have the inflation that just happened and but then the stock market crashes, you're, you're going to lose some voters there. So I, I have to think they're going to try and keep this thing rolling for at least through the elections. Um, that doesn't mean so the, there's the phrase sell in May and go away. So, um, you know, maybe the summer, maybe there'll be a summer lull at some point here. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's kind of what the markets look like um, in Monero finding resistance at, at the obvious place to find it. Um, but overall, like, I think we should, we should be happy that we've, we've effectively proven that we don't need the exchanges to keep our price, to maintain our price. We've proven that we're, we're basically the only crypto with a, a real organic price. Um, maybe there's a few out there, but you know, Monero's, Monero's it. Monero's the one guys, like Monero's the thing that we need to maximize before we go flipping off to these other, other privacy coins or other cryptocurrencies. Oh, you know, I guess we could take a look at what the other privacy coins did. Mm, why is Tron here? They're not a privacy coin. Oh, that's the wrong one. This one, this one. Uh, yeah, so, okay. The only thing that's actually doing anything good right now. Oh, you know, maybe, maybe wow. Wow token. Do I not have the right one? I don't think this is wow. Oh, that's right. I couldn't find it. It was weird. I wasn't able to find um, wow narrow on. Okay, but anyways, Darrow not looking good. Z trash crashing. Z crash. Um, R is unimpressive. Xano is the only one here that's actually done something interesting in the past couple weeks. So, um, yeah, keep, uh, keep using your Monero. If you're the hodler type, you know, okay, that's cool. You know, I hodl as well. Um, but that's mostly cause you need a fat stash for a good privacy, a good privacy stash of Monero. Um, but yeah, keep using it guys. Um, cheers. Yeah. It seems like Xano pumped just a little bit surprisingly yeah it's um it came up it, it actually pumped almost 50 percent. it's had a retrace here 24 percent, but in the past uh three days it, it's had another 15 percent. so um yeah this actually it actually looks nice it looks kind of like a bottoming pattern up um it's kind of chilling out here it's it's setting a higher low so this thing could very well be setting up to make another move here to to the upside and Xano's starting to get uh it's starting to get more popularity with the Monero crowd too. So it's actually uh it's it's actually starting to see more like get more attention and probably more usage. So I think that's cool. I um I know we got some hardcore uh proof of work maximalists, but um I, at least if nothing else, I think that, that we could probably trust Zoidberg is honest and he's not trying to like rip anyone off, so You know, and the, the intention of honesty counts for a lot when it when it comes to crypto. Track record, sure. that kind of thing. Yeah, having the uh the confidential assets is uh is pretty cool, but I, I do understand why some people would be concerned about the hybrid proof of stake and proof of work. Um as it seems like proof of stake has been less proven to be a good system in the past. Um and not that it's not possible, but it hasn't been done well in the past. You know, I read a paper on this um, a couple of weeks ago. It talked about, so there's three different proof of stake mechanisms that they looked at. And what they wanted to do is show whether or not you had provable fairness. So fairness being, if I invest, say, three and a half percent of the staked, like the total staked um, token, am I going to get three and a half percent of the rewards? Um, so they wanted to look, does the network produce provable fairness and does it produce robust fairness? So over long time frames, do you expect it to converge to the level that it should be like fairly assessed at? And most proof of stake networks actually were provably either unfair or had issues with their fairness. Um, so in other words, like you could put some amount of token in there, but you're actually going to lose, you're going to get diluted over time. Interestingly enough, um, they, they analyzed Ethereum and their mechanism as being not only uh, provably fair, but also robustly fair. Um, so there weren't too many proof of stake networks that could say that for both cases. Obviously, the big point is um, how do you launch a network directly from proof of stake and be fair uh, with just proof of stake? And um, I, I still I think Zoidberg had a lot of ideas about it. So, um, you know, Andre had had a bunch of ideas there. Um, I haven't like really hardcore looked into them to see. You know whether or not I I think they're good game theory or not, but um, hey, if anyone can do it, you know maybe he could. All right, let's see if is uh I guess Doug is AFK. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Any anything else that uh, people want to see that we can look at chart wise? Oh yeah, let's maybe take a look at these YouTube comments here. 
don't really see any exchanges are competing to get real Monero. They might be. If I was a scumbag exchange, I would be betting on the fact that uh, <laughs> that everything Monero is going to get delisted. Um, maybe, maybe if an exchange was smart, they would actually be trying to drop liquidity onto the new decentralized platforms. I feel like these exchanges kind of have like little dirty misdeeds. And so it seems to me that they do have a need for Monero to some extent. And, and I felt like I felt like that was kind of a thing Binance was doing. They were really playing both sides of uh, of the table here where they were like shorting Monero, like fractionally reserving it, you know, naked shorting it effectively while still using it um, <laughs> to interact in, in dirty places that they didn't want anyone to know about. Uh, obviously, that's speculative, but it, it does feel like if you're an exchange and you're kind of like, you're running your exchange on the fringes of the corporate world, you know, barely legal or whatever. <laughs> um, it does seem like you, you need Monero in that case, but who knows? Zephyr that stole our hash rate is going downhill as well. Pre mine scam. Oh, you know what? Maybe we should look at Zephyr because, yeah, screw them. I always hear about those guys and they're always stealing our hash rate. Uh, Zephyr is for they a long time, on? yeah. Oh, Jesus. That's a round tripper. Oof. What did they do? Two thousand percent, and then they wow. came back down. Wow. I bet if we looked at the, I bet if we looked at their liquidity, I bet it's pretty. That's low. staggering. Yeah. Here, let's take a look at the volume. Pin to new scale on the left. Let's go logarithmic. Um, so their volumes look like they're about. I think this is would be measured in Zeph, and since their price is two dollars, oh wow, that's actually. That's surprisingly high volume. That's these are this is daily volume. So they they were like hovering between twenty thousand and hundred thousand. Mm. That actually Bro, is really, really high. Oh, man, you really could have, Jesus, you really could have gotten into this coin and made a made a twenty x. Damn. This seems like the kind of thing. So the fact that they were competing with our hash rate, I wonder. If this wasn't um, some kind of like orchestrated scam, shitcoin scam by, you know, by the same usual suspects that were probably part of the fractional reserve Monero scheme. Again, that's totally speculative, but that's the kind of games they play. So I just sort of immediately go there in my speculations. Um, yeah, I don't know anything else about Zephyr other than I kept hearing about it for it was the more profitable coin to mine. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> Not anymore, bros. Let's see. Hey, guys, is cake still the best option for prepaid cards in your experience? Well, Tux, I think that would be right up your alley, sir. Well, obviously, I'm biased here, but I I still use I do use cake pay myself for getting cards and it still works well. Now, I will mention that we had some some good Visa in MasterCards that recently um we don't have available anymore due to the provider taking them off. We're trying to get those back. <clears throat> the current Visa MasterCards work, but they don't have the same features. Like I don't believe they have 3D secure like the previous ones did. So they might not work for all vendors, unfortunately. But we're trying to get those old ones back. Uh, but for any other card, like gift card, you shouldn't have any problems with those at all. Excellent. Prepaid credit cards are a nightmare if you use a VPN. You know, oh, I've, totally. I've, yep. I can't remember what's it called. The um, shopping bit, I think. The ones where you can mm -hmm. pay Monero for like a, just a general card. I have not been able to use that like hardly anywhere. Uh, maybe it's because I'm not shopping in the United States. It needs to be in the United States. Oh, I wanted to ask you, do, are the cards on Cake Wallet, are those US only or can you get other jurisdictions? Nope, you can get, uh, you can get lots of, we offer cards for like dozens and dozens of countries oh, nice. and it Mexico? just you can check on yeah yeah we definitely have some from mexico uh, lots of gift cards and we might also have the uh the visa and mastercard the debit cards uh you can check um stock and availability just depends on the country but you can filter by country and see which ones are available gotcha yeah i'm starting to run out of fiat here i try to minimize my fiat exposure and <laughs> I feel like I don't use the Monero card ecosystem sufficiently. Like I don't really leverage what I can with Monero. So I feel like I'm going to try and make a pivot here in my, you know, cause I, I'm going to shamefully admit I, I buy shit on Amazon. You know, I buy stuff on Amazon and you could totally easily, easily get a credit card, um, an Amazon card for Monero in like a lot of different ways. So oh, yeah, totally. I'm going to try and, you know, I, I get Starbucks, you know, I'm going to try and like pivot my, 
pivot my daily expenditures to actually like using Monero a little bit more hardcore. But, uh, you know, I had that dirty fiat for so long as like, you want to spend the money that's, that's worth, that's, that's falling in value before you actually spend your, exactly. your hard-earned yeah. Monero. It's reasonable, but at the same time, we're trying to do, you know, use a Monero circular economy. So it's kind of a hard thing. Yeah. hundred percent. But you can totally buy Amazon. Yeah, and this would be, this is a lot easier than buying just the regular debit card because like you might run into some issues. And one thing uh, that is annoying, and this is the case with basically every single uh, gift card crypto for crypto store I've seen is that if you, if you buy the, the regular debit cards, not, not a specific gift card to a vendor, but the regular debit cards, they ask you for a bunch of information. If you get the regular gift card, so like the Amazon one, you don't have to give them any information. You just mm. get the card, get the code, and use that on your account. No problem. Hey, guys, any of you, uh, any of you chads watching the show, do us a favor and smash that like. All the chads are watching over new pipes, so they can't really smash the like, but, you know. It's understandable. If you, if, if you happen to be in the comments, smash the like. We only got, we only got, we only got three smashes on the likes. Or you can gently press it, whichever your preference. 29 watching. Oh, see, now I, I see want... 17. I think you have to reload the page like every few minutes in order to. Oh, okay. Yeah, it doesn't <laughs> update live for some reason, even though it's such a basic thing to do. Yeah, I even said, okay, so I just reloaded. It's showing 19 now. That's weird that you would think that YouTube would, uh, would like have that figured out. 